Hello. Welcome to the Maison Francaise of New York University. My name is Philip John Usher. This is the eighth episode of our series, Conversations with People Who Read Montaigne. Thank you for tuning in. Merci pour votre fidélité. Today, my guest is Patrick Madden. Patrick is a professor in the College of Humanities at Brigham Young University. It's difficult to know exactly where to start in introducing Patrick. He is first and foremost, and that is why he's here today, an essayist. He is an essayist who, like most essayists, has spent a lot of time reading the essay of Michel de Montaigne. He's the author of no a number of prize-winning essay collections, Quotidiana from 2010, Sublime Physique from uh, 2016, and most recently, Disparates from 2020. He has also co-edited with fellow essayist David Lazar a collection titled After Montaigne, Contemporary Essayists Cover the Essays, which came out in 2015. Perhaps that 2015 collection is a good place to start my introduction today, for the way it ties together Montaigne as the author of the essay and essay writing more widely. To After Montaigne, Patrick contributed a really compelling chapter titled Of Practice, after Montaigne's own chapter 2-6 of the same name, De l'Exercitation in the original, the well-read chapter in which Montaigne describes, quote, one of his men, a big strong fellow on a powerful farm horse, uh, came down like a colossus upon him, a little man on a little horse, comme un colosse sur le petit homme et le petit cheval. He knocks him over to the floor, causes him to lose consciousness and to experience as much as one can, death or at least its antechamber. Patrick's chapter indeed mentions Montaigne explicitly. Let me quote Patrick. Like many people I've met, I struggled to get Montaigne the first time I read his essays. I found him a bit dry, and having been raised surrounded by narrative, I wondered where the stories were. But with time and patience, I grew not only to understand him, but to love him, as I saw the shape of his mind laid out on the page, and I wanted to adopt his method of literary exploration. Patrick's chapter is not about a near-death experience, but about volleyball, about playing volleyball when one is young and one is not quite so young, about practice and about the limits of practice, about reaching, quote, the plateau and decline of middle age, about how useful busyness morphs with time into feeling harried and hobbled. It's a reflective chapter that is, in a sense, Montaigne, yet never a pastiche, always its own essay, although an essay, a meta-essay, in which we do meet Montaigne a number as a, as a point of origin. I slowly realized, says Patrick, I could create for myself a life full of thinking by writing essays, which would permit me to explore a subject for as long as it held my interest, to learn as much as I could through study and memory, and to make artful association toward a new creation. Patrick is never knocked from his horse in that chapter, but he is indeed knocked down on the volleyball court. An over-exuberant young hitter threw himself at a too low, too tight set and came crashing under the net, sliding right under my feet just before I landed on him. He was whistled for the violation, but this was small consolation. My foot, failing to find him, floor, fi failing to find firm floor, wrenched outward, tearing my ligaments and spraining my ankle. Patrick's most recent essay collection, Disparates, building on the formal experiments and in his earlier ones, is a true kaleidoscope in the best sense. As when we read the essay, when we read Disparates, we encounter a human being. We come to know something of his biography, but a lot more about moments, about the meandering of a mind and a body and a world. There is an opening chapter about the sale of a second-hand bottle of Dasani water, chapters with titles such as Nostalgia, Laughter, Order, Memory, and Timing. There's a chapter titled Smells, which, as you might expect, is a translation or transformation of Montaigne's chapter 155, On Smells, Des Senteurs. Screech's rendering begins as follows. Of some such as Alexander the Great, it is said that their sweat smelt nice because of some rare complexion outside the natural order, the cause of which was sought by Plutarch and others. Patrick's transformation, co-realized with Stephen Haney, starts this way. Alexander the Great had his PR guy spread the rumor that his sweat not only didn't stink, but that it smelled good because his body was better than everyone else's. Plutarch and others tried to find the cause of that sweet sweat. The formal experiments throughout Disparates are numerous and of numerous types. There is a chapter of Proverbs, if you can't beat a dead horse, join him, illustrated with drawings done by Patrick's children. There is a chapter so timely amidst current debates at chat, about ChatGPT titled Unpredictable Essays, which is co-created by Patrick and Botnik's predictive writer. And there is a chapter, a very moving chapter, titled Repeat, Repast. Pages 46 to 50 feature not traditional prose, but a series of five squares of letters, five word search puzzles, the solution to which are given at the end of the book on pages 154 to 156. And then, having digested the unexpectedness of finding word puzzles in a book of essays, the reader's gaze falls to the list of words below the squares. Noticing perhaps the occasional initial capital letters and punctuation marks, commas and such like, the reader starts reading. 
and reads how, after she died, Patrick's mother left behind a book in her alcove, ultimate word search, decorated with her handwritten notes. The word clues to the final square begin thus. If, as Borges promises, when writers die, they become books, then perhaps even my mother, who never wrote more than notes, may yet be recovered in my books. Disparates, like the essay collections that preceded it, quoted Yana and Sublime Physic, are the work of an essayist who, after Montaigne, weaves together the varied and disconnected strands of the self, at times joyous, at times melancholic. There will be much more to say to introduce Patrick, including the fact that, like our previous guest, Jeff Purcells, he owns a Montaigne costume. But I would rather stand back and hand over the microphone. It's my pleasure to welcome Patrick here today to our series. As a quick reminder, each episode of this series is divided into three parts. In a first moment, Patrick will answer my Montaigne questionnaire, the same questions that I ask in each episode so that we can get to know one of Montaigne's readers. In a second moment, Patrick will read from his work for us. And in a third moment, the final moment, we'll have a discussion uh, between ourselves and with you who are joining us via Zoom today. So please go ahead and enter your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen now or at any point throughout this talk. N'hésitez pas à taper dès maintenant vos questions en anglais ou en français avec l'option QA au bas de votre écran Zoom. I'll be reading them out when we get to this part of the conversation, and I'll be happy to translate if needed. So it's time for a questionnaire. So my first question, Patrick, uh, when, how, why did you first read Montaigne's essays? And I'm just going to unmute you uh, so that we can hear you. Uh, oh, there we go. All right. So Am I yes. now? You are indeed. So when, how, and why did you first read Montaigne's essays? Uh, before we get into that, thanks a lot for having me on the webinar, the podcast. <clears throat> I'm really grateful that I can be included in conversation with people who read Montaigne. I think it's a pretty unassuming title for the series, and I appreciate that because I am not really an academic expert, but I am certainly a reader of Montaigne and love to have conversations about him and his work. And so I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much. Uh, I first encountered Montaigne's essays when I was in graduate school. I studied physics as an undergrad, and although I had some literature courses, I never encountered Montaigne then. When I had kind of a an epiphany that I really wanted to let myself think widely, I thought essays could be the way to do it. And some of my earliest influences were more contemporary essays, essays who are still living now. But uh, in my master's program, my thesis advisor, John Benyon, had studied with uh, Philip Lopate, who is well-known essayist, still living. And Lopate had edited The Art of the Personal Essay, which is a pretty handy tome filled with essays from uh, Plutarch to almost the present day now. And of course, Montaigne is, has his own section. He's called The Fountainhead. And in the book, there are three of his essays, of a monstrous child, of books, and on some verses of Virgil. So there's a short, a medium, and a long essay. And at the time, as as you said in the introduction, I, I didn't quite get it. I was used to a different prose style. This felt to me rather stuffy, even though uh, this uses the Donald Frame translation from the 1940s. And so that's an American English, and not too far before my time, it was pretty updated, but for me, who hadn't had much experience, I struggled to get into the prose and I looked for a story and there wasn't much of one. I really um, didn't perceive the humor of the essays, even though I can now perceive it. So my first encounter was a bit of a, <laughs> a negative one, but I blame myself. I did go on to study a PhD at Ohio University where I studied with David Lazar, and he had also studied with Philip Lopate in graduate school. And so I had more of that influence. And with David Lazar, I had a history and theory of the essay course, as well as many workshops, writing workshops. And again, um, I had these essays from the Art of the Personal Essay, but I read not all of the essays, but a fair number of them. And I think the initial feeling was it was a bit of a struggle, but gradually, I understood that essay was not story, that generically they're different, and they're different not just in the nonfiction fiction divide, but in the method of approaching a subject. Now for essay, the idea is primary and story serves the essay. And that essays are inconclusive, that they are exploratory, driven by questions and curiosity and 
um, self-deprecating. And I found all these things in Montaigne's essays. So that's when I started to catch on and eventually kind of flipped my perspective 180 to where I now believe that if you would, if you want to be an essayist, you have to love Montaigne's essays. And I, I started to see how even the essays that I had read, like 20th century Americans and some British writers, um, were all influenced directly or indirectly through the lines from Montaigne's essays. So I became a big fan at that time. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's always amazing talking with people um, about their first reading of Montaigne. There's often a chance encounter or a first sort of resistance, and it's it's yeah. it's. Um, uh, I mean, it's it's quite an amazing miracle that uh, that we have now ended up in a situation where many people love him. I mean, there's like this hurdle at the start so often. Um, so, question number two. So, which of the chapters of the essay uh, is one that over the years you find yourself returning to? Uh, and maybe it's the same question, maybe it's not. Uh, which is your favorite chapter? Um, so one of your recent guests, Tom Conley, had the same answer I do, which is of practice. And I do want to talk about that essay. That's the essay that I covered in that anthology of After Montaigne essays. And so you spoke a little bit about that too. <clears throat> but if I might, I would like to speak about a couple other essays on the pathway there. So um, one of the essays that I returned to Every semester, I teach it to my students because I think it's nicely compact. Um, even a class that's not about Montaigne's essays, I can cover this and demonstrate to them what essays are and do historically and even uh, now of A Monster's Child. So that very first essay of Montaigne's that I ever read was because of the first one in The Art of the Personal Essay. Um, I've come to really love, and it does a few things that are traditional or typical of essays, and it does a few things that challenge what essays normally do. So the opening line, this story will go to a simply for I leave it to the doctors to discuss it. And I I should say, I mentioned Frame's translation. That is my favorite translation, and probably because it's the first I encounter, but also it overlaps me pretty well in terms of it's an American and it's the 20th century. So I mean, that's the one I use. Oh, and the other thing is um, I had initially the Stanford University Press edition, but I started, the binding was breaking, and I started losing pages. So I went to get a new copy of Montaigne's essays, and I found the complete works, which is hardback, and it has uh, like sewn in pages. And so I went to buy it from the university bookstore. And as I was checking out, they scanned my ID, and I won a random $100 gift card to the to the bookstore. So I ended up costing me negative $70. So I came out ahead financially buying that book. So I feel like that was confirmation I was doing the right thing. Anyway, um, the story will go to a simple before I leave it to the doctors to discuss. Sounds to me like a promise that he's not going to do much anal analysis. He's just going to tell you what happened. And then he does, for two paragraphs, he describes the monstrous child. And He's pretty um, clinical about it. He, he doesn't seem to be twisting things judgmentally. Um, and then he does, he breaks his promise. So he tries to make something of it. And I'm going to read a little more of this later, but I love the fact that uh, it shows the process of the essay. He doesn't revise out his initial promise. And he just kind of lets through. And there's there's successive revisions of it, of course, in the in the different printings of the essays. But um, that to me, and it becomes a little didactic at the end, but didactic in a way that is eye-opening for the entire culture, the way that um, we assume that the thing, the the ways of seeing that we're brought up with are the correct ways. And that's not the case. So that's one of my absolute favorite essays. And it's very short, so very easy and compact. Another nice short essay that I love to return to is uh, How Our Mind Hinders Itself, which is second book, uh, 14th essay. Um, and because it's a kind of like really frivolous essay, it begins with the premise, it is an amusing conception to imagine a mind exactly balanced between two equal desires. And then he gets to 
if we were placed between the bottle and the ham with an equal appetite for drinking and eating, there would be there would doubtless be no solution but to die of thirst and of hunger. Well, he becomes ridiculous in it. And that's kind of a pattern in that essay. It's also just four paragraphs, I think. Um, because he's just trying to tease out this question, like, why do we choose one thing over another if they seem identical to us? This is not any earth-shattering question that everybody needs to resolve. If you're going to pick one coin over another, like he suggests, nobody really belabors that. They just pick a coin. But he does allow himself to kind of crescendo, amp it up to the point where he ends with plenty. There's nothing certain but uncertainty and nothing more miserable and arrogant than man. There's kind of like a big punch slam the door <laughs> at the end of the essence. Um, there are a few others that I love. I love the origin story that you find in Of Idleness, how he describes his plan to just hold up in the tower, let himself read at leisure, and um, see where that goes. And he discovers that his mind is like an unbridled horse and goes wherever it wants. He can't keep a control, so he decides to write in order to make his mind ashamed of itself, which is a odd phrase that I'm not entirely sure I understand. Maybe you could... Uh, you know, enlighten me from the French. But, um, and then one more before practice of cripples, which I love because like a lot of essays, uh, the title is not its main subject. It doesn't come round to its title until, I don't know, three quarters, seven eighths of the way, I don't know, into the essay. And it really, it starts out, he, he mentions how um, in France, they lost 10 days out of their calendar recently in order for, uh, you know, the Pope's astronomers had discovered that not only did they need leap years every four years, they needed not leap years every hundred years. And they had not been doing that. So Easter was getting further and further from where it astronomically should have been. And so Montaigne used that as a way of talking about the folly of trying to control nature and how the peasants are going to just plant and harvest at the same time as always. Um, and then it becomes a kind of meditation on the ways that we can rationalize anything. We can, we think we're being reasonable and we hold reason as uh, the, the highest level of human thought, but reason works retroactively to explain or justify any situation you can explain the exact same thing in two opposed ways and convince yourself so that i think is quite useful for its humbling influence um i'm a person who as i said i studied physics i love that um maybe pre-20th century worldview where things were easy to put into formulas and you could get the exact right answer um montaigne's essays don't believe that and they they've taught me to be more and more humble about what i think that i can actually know so and then finally if i could keep going of practice which i think is a very contemporary style essay like essays in montana style are not very narrative at all like he says there's nothing so contrary to my style as an extended narration but in this one there's actually a story at the base of it and it's it's not just any story. It's like a pretty dramatic story where he's knocked from his horse, taken for dead. and But he doesn't tell this story as a kind of brag or something like, check out this cool thing that happened to me. He's using it as an experiment because the essay begins thinking about, you can practice anything and get better at it, but you can't practice for death. But wait a minute, maybe you can practice for death every time you go to sleep. Oh, but there's this other thing that's even more like practicing for death, which is when I was unconscious. And so I think it plays really well with my students who want to hear some kind of a story. And most of the essays don't have a story at their core. That one does. And it's also in the second half, it's kind of uh, an apologetics for, the, for writing essays. And so I appreciate how it shifts with this account of so trivial, trivial an event would be rather pointless were it not for the instruction that I've derived from it for myself. And then he says, and... If it's useful for me, maybe it's useful for other people. And then he gets into some criticisms he's received about he talks too much of himself, 
And he says, that's not bad. If, it, if you overestimate or underestimate, that might be bad. But having a, a fair estimation of yourself, we should think more about ourselves. And um, so like on this page of it where it just begins that I have almost every line of it underlined. This is what my annotations look like in the book. It's kind of defeats the purpose when everything is underlined, but I find that it does both things beautifully well. It tells an engaging story, but then it uses the story for something that you wouldn't normally expect. It wouldn't be the way most people today would tell that story. And then it kind of shifts into an explanation of, or a, like a lesson on essaying that we can all take to heart too. So those are some essays that I love and go to all the time. And I think chief among them would be of practice. Mm. Thank you, Patrick. No, great, great chapters. And uh, I remember my, uh, the, 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 the first person I, I really read uh, the essays with uh, as an undergraduate who, uh, who, who looked at me uh, underlining one day and said, Philip, there's really no point underlining. You have to underline everything. Right. And, uh, it's kind of <laughs> true, right? Because <laughs> so uh, question number three, uh, why do you think we should read Montaigne in 2024? Um, so, yeah, as a convert to Montaigne, I can still recall um, the way I was prior, and I think a lot of people are, are this way, um, not really, not even wanting the type of wisdom that Montaigne is sharing, which is what I was just talking about, <clears throat> a kind of worldview where things are not hard and fast or black and white where things are always nuanced. Um, I'm trying to recall, and I can't exactly, I can only paraphrase, but he says, um, the middle way is the more challenging way because you don't have the wall or the edge to guide you, right? Um, it's not unique to Montaigne, but it is still a pretty rare perspective, I find. Um, so... Some years ago, well, with my second book, Sublime Physic, I kind of facetiously uh, made the comment, WWMD, what would Michel do as a kind of, uh, you know, wristband thing instead of what would Jesus do? And one of the only negative reviews I've ever received was from Kirkus, and it picked that up and said, what would Montaigne do? left to write a fresh collection of essays, he might not leave with a piece in which expectoration takes center stage. So they take an issue with my essay, Spit. Um, and I read this and I thought, that's not true. I think Montaigne would lead with an essay in which expectoration takes center stage. He was quite about the bodily fluids and functions. But anyway, the, the idea of WMD does actually guide me. Not in a, like a, well, maybe it is a cheesy, jokey way, but also in a serious way. Um, so I'm not unique in noting divisiveness in our day and age and the ways in which so many people are so self-assured, so certain of what they know. And one of the key elements of the essays, maybe one of like the major project of the essays was to occupy, to imagine perspectives outside of Montaigne's own, to see things, like see how other cultures do things and grant those ways validity and value and not operate from the base assumption that how things are done in France is the way, the best way, right? It's kind of, in that sense, would be maybe nationalistic pride, but even I think that type of perspective is rare and it presumes that we can like dislodge ourselves from our formation and i think we can but it's not without effort so reading montaigne's essays has absolutely done that for me um growing up i received a lot of feedback about the math and the science way of uh perceiving the world when i got to my undergrad when i was studying physics i learned that all of like the great discoveries of 20th century physics were all about changing the worldview. Any, any real discovery in physics was anti-formulaic, even though I mean, they still use formulas, but 
just like paradigm wise, um, you couldn't like you couldn't do more with Newtonian physics anymore, right? Newtonian physics describes things very well, very accurately, but not all the way there, right? You start to get the subatomic particles and <clears throat> Newtonian physics breaks down. So um, in order for scientists recently now still to make progress in the ways we understand the world, they have to like forget the deterministic worldview, the mechanical clockwork type of way of seeing things and try different metaphors around things work. And I think Montaigne was already there, not, not researching science per se, but definitely, um, like I said, dislodging from the assumptions that his culture had built into him. And <clears throat> like I think of the essay of cannibals in which Montaigne's joy is discovering how the Brazilians viewed France. Because here are some real life people whose assumptions are completely different. So he wants to know what they see of what he takes for granted. And so it's challenging and amusing. And But that's the great value of Montaigne that I think everybody could benefit from. And I certainly have. Thank you. No, it, um, yeah, the, I think the, the, I don't know, it struck me this semester I'm teaching Montaigne again and uh, walking into the classroom with this really big book and then announcing that it's about humility and pointless adventures and not knowing and uh, this contrast between having such a, but I think that's the point, right? Like they, as you say, it's hard work to realize how little you know and uh, how how uncertain things are. So, so question four, uh, which is the article or book uh, about Montaigne, uh, which you didn't write, uh, that you most often recommend to students or colleagues or friends? Um, so several of your guests have already mentioned Sarah Bakewell's How to Live, Life of Montaigne, which I was excited when I heard of it, and it didn't disappoint. I came in with high expectations, but it provides the historical and cultural context that I was not aware of and too busy or too lazy to discover myself in all the sources. So it does a really good job of gathering um, all of that background and also presenting the ideas of the essays in um, kind of a condensed form. So I, I've taught that book several times and I do recommend it. Another one I just found and have um, taught this last year is Antoine Compagnon, A Summer with Montaigne, which are like short, his own little meditations inspired by Montaigne's essays is like the sort of thing anybody could do. And so that's how I've used it for myself and for my students as a model of like Montaigne kind of covered a lot of as some other essays say he, he covered it all, but you can still pick up from where he went and like make it your own too. Um, and then I really like several essays by essayists that are not critical in the sense of like secondary sourcing and um, piecing ideas together, but they're more like overview type pieces. I collected a bunch of them. I made my own little booklet of essays on Montaigne. They're almost all just called Montaigne. So for instance, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's Montaigne or the Skeptic, which I love. Um, it has Arthur Tilly, Montaigne, Thomas Carlyle, Montaigne, Henry Dwight Sedgwick, Montaigne, George Edward Woodbury, Montaigne. Everybody just called their piece Montaigne. Um, and I love Virginia Woolf's Montaigne, in which um, I mean I think they give a value perspective, not just of porting Montaigne into themselves and seeing in him an exemplar, a model, and then finding ways in which that can be inspiration for writing. And then one that is not called Montaigne, but is basically about him is uh, Alexander Smith, a 19th century Scottish poet who wrote a book of essays called Dreamthorpe, a book of essays in the country. And the kind of introductory note, which is the second chapter, though, is called On the Writing of Essays. And it, it sets out to be a kind of comparison between the two great early essays, Bacon and Montaigne. But 
I still haven't come around to Bacon all the way, and neither had Alexander Smith. Like Bacon is is a bit stuffy. He's the kind he's he seems to be operating out of the know it all position, like high on the hill, pontificating to the rabble or something like this. And um, Montaigne was never that way. So uh, Smith says a lot of really insightful, great things about like how to be an essayist and Montaigne is his exemplar. <clears throat> For instance, the world is everywhere whispering essays. One need only be the world's amanuensis. This is one of the great things. It talks about the infinite suggestiveness of common things, which I've also taken as a kind of motto. But here he says, Bacon always seems to write with his ermine on. Montaigne was different from all this. His table of contents reads in comparison like a medley or a catalog of an auction. He was quite as wise as Bacon. He could look through men quite as clearly and search them quite as narrowly. Certain of his moods were quite as serious. And in one corner of his heart, he kept a young, uh, kept a yet profounder melancholy. But he was volatile, a humorist, and a gossip. He could be dignified enough on great occasions, but dignity and great occasion bored him. He could stand in the presence with propriety enough, but then he got out of the presence as rapidly as possible. So this is, I think, a really brilliant analysis of Montaigne, but it remains like very popularly accessible too. So <clears throat> those are some that I love. Is it is this are you are you editing this as an anthology or you should if well like I said I just made this thing and like spiral bound it at the at the bookstore, but yeah. Uh -huh. There's some good ones in there. That's very cool. Uh, so um, let's move into part two of our of our conversation here. And uh, Patrick, you're going to share some of your work with us, which is which is super kind, including some some new writing. Uh, right. So over to you. I'll let you let you steer us. Right. I will share my screen. I have a presentation to um, keep people's interest. I hope. And does that seem to be working? And your screen is showing the like all screen says just thumbs on. All right, good. Yeah, okay. Um, so I've chosen to share a few of the shorter essays I've written, all of which are inspired by or mention Montaigne. And um, the PowerPoint is just a bit decoration and a few of the quotes that are pulled too. So um, one of the first Montaigne inspirations I took was from his essay of Thumbs, and this was at the 2007 Nonfiction Now Conference in Iowa City at the University of Iowa, when a uh, fellow essayist, Dinty Moore, uh, inspired by, oh, let me double check the name, Lars von Trier's film, The Five Obstructions, uh, assigned a number of writers to write with obstructions based on the dice that they rolled. And so the dice that I rolled told me to write an essay in nine paragraphs, like Montaigne's English translation, starting with the same letters as his paragraphs, and to write with little or no narrative. So this is what I came up with. And this is Salvador Dali's illustration for Montaigne's essay of thumbs. Thumb, for its similarity to some, provides a ready linguistic pun when one makes the name change, when one is in a mood for thumb humor. Perhaps the most difficult thumb for some switch would be the word something rendered thumb thing, as in something in the way she moves attracts me like no other lover. Sinatra, it is said, once sang it as a cover, claiming it was his favorite Lennon-McCartney composition. Harrison, in his typical grace and humility, did not mind. He had a good laugh about it, thumbed his nose at the whole fame and ego trip. He was never one to stick out. Me, frankly, I prefer any number of Harrison songs. Here comes the sun, for instance, tax man, think for yourself. Of something, only the bridge appeals to me and then only musically. You're asking me, will my love grow? The answer, I don't know. I don't know. I wonder, would we thumb our noses still if not for this phrase? Does anybody really thumb their nose anymore? Corollary to thumb humor is thumbprint art, a malaise that flared up during my middle school years and which seems to have been eradicated in most of the world. Somebody loves you, declared a pink whirl with line-drawn arms and legs, cheeky smile, perhaps a shock of hair. I think I can remember an early understanding of the double meaning. Thumb body? A body that's a thumb? Quite a different connection comes to me today. I notice there's only one B. I attach it to the T-H-U-M, leaving thumb Odie. Odie can take me either to Garfield or to Latin by way of Spanish, where odio is hate. 
I come back to English where odious is hateful, and I have a satisfactory judgment on the cutesy creatures. There's another song that's been clamoring for my literary attentions as the priest across the aisle from me whispers, what, the rosary, as he fiddles with his glasses, adjusts the airflow from above, thumbs through his scriptures. Don't you want somebody to love, asked Jefferson Airplane, when they were still legitimate before they started name changing. It was a common question for the time. Speaking of those questions without answers, what is with Ringo stalling his mates? Do you need anybody, they ask in three-part harmony. I need somebody to love. Could it be any anybody? I just need Thumbbone to love. Or is it Thumbbone? It's the end of that one. And this is the uh, story of a misadventure. There's me. The first goal of the Madden 2014 Madden Family European Road Vacation was my pilgrimage to Montaigne's Tower in the Perigord region east of Bordeaux. We arrived after a long day in the car and were surprised to find a chain blocking the entrance. Turns out the site was closed not just on Mondays, as I'd been warned, but on Tuesdays as well. After a few minutes of pleading in fake French, I got to speak to the gardener who spoke English and who graciously led us on a tour of the grounds, including some wild and tame life encounters, birds, lizards, a snake, and several donkeys. I told him how I was a disciple of Montaigne, wrote my own essays, was editing a book paying homage to the master essayist. He said he wasn't much for reading Montaigne, but he sure liked caring for the plant life around the place. Laurent's patience and kindness were extraordinary, and as my family turned finally to leave, he gave me a lifelong teetotaler, a bottle of Chateau Michel de Montaigne wine, 20, 2001 vintage. In all, it was an utterly pleasant afternoon, despite my getting so close but failing to visit the tower. The way I figure... I can take this thwarted pilgrimage two ways. I can be disappointed, upset, what have you, or I can do like an essayist and use what really happened to my benefit. Like Alexander Smith said of Montaigne, each event of his past life he considers a fact of nature, creditable or the reverse. There it is, sometimes to be speculated upon, not in the least to be regretted. If it is worth nothing else, it may be made the subject of an essay. Or as Paul in my Paraphrased approximation. All things work to the good of them that love the essay. When I set out, I'd hoped to see with my own eyes the inscriptions on the beams of Montaigne's library. Sure, but I had joined. A, but had I joined a regular tour, I'd have never met Laurent. I'd have been processed through the attraction like so many glassy-eyed high school kids. I'd have paused and examined, yes, and I'd have taken some pictures. But I did those things anyway from outside the walls. And one of the things I considered is this that there's something appropriate about being stymied in an essayistic quest, because essays were never about completing things. They distrust the very notion of tidy endings. Much better, it seems to me now, that I missed the dusty tower and instead strolled the grounds with the gardener, who, like the great dead man he and I serve, contains within him the entire human condition. That's the end of that one. And this is an essay about that Montaigne costume that was mentioned in the opening. There it is, in fact. I can show you. Hanging on the door. The Montaigne cup. Without quite realizing it, over the past dozen years, I've been training my body to automatically close my office door with the ideal amount of effort, imparting the exact momentum for the task. I should clarify, I'd swing the door shut as I'm leaving, aiming for the sweet spot. A gentle click with nary a harsh slam and nary a miss, because in this hurried age, who has the time to pause and hold the handle all the way, or worse, to return to finishing the jarring job? My timing had become impeccable. As I'd sling on my backpack and slide out the door, I'd reach back with my left hand, catch the handle, and without breaking stride, flick slightly towards me. I'd not even turn back. I'd just hear the satisfying kiss of snug contact and know that I'd left my things locked safely inside. Grammarians such as myself may have noticed the verb tense in the previous sentences, especially had become, which says more than it denotes, I think. Why, we must ask, is the narrator's timing no longer impeccable? What trouble do these tenses portend? All the occasions for the troubles of the world are grammatic. Speaking of Montaigne, it's his fault that my door no longer closes all the way, that in the past weeks I've repeatedly heard no click, had to stop, turn around, and thrust my hand back to the handle to close the door firmly and finally. 
I'd calculate that I've lost a good minute of quality time, I was told. It's Montaigne's fault, I realized, after several confused days, because I've got a Montaigne custom hanging on the back of the door. For years it wasn't there, but now it's there. So I've added weight to the door, thereby increasing its moment of inertia. Moment of inertia resonates with the title of this essay. So now I've partially resolved that little question you may have been carrying since you started listening. The object of the detective's quest you unwittingly set out to clarify. At the very least, you know to pay attention to the phrase. Perhaps you recall from physics class that the moment of inertia describes a body's resistance to angular acceleration. The inertia part echoes Newton's first law of motion. An object remains at rest, remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. More popularly, we think of inertia as immobility, stagnation, idleness, and at least resistance to motion. It is something to be overcome. The moment in the phrase refers to the product of a force acting at a distance from a reference point to produce a rotational acceleration. As far as I can ascertain, it has nothing to do with the moments we're used to, the brief moments of time, the ones that inexorably add up to our lives, that fly till they run out their race. And the phrase, entire moment of inertia, certainly we recognize a metaphor when it's staring us in the face. Hold on a moment, though. Did you say Montaigne costume? I did. That's the result of a lovely confluence of several felicitous happenstances. Where to begin? Ah, one day in the hallway, I ran into my friend Bob Hudson, who I think is here at the webinar, wearing an ornate French Renaissance outfit, accoutrement of his teaching that day. I expressed my admiration, and he explained his providence. A student had asked to create the costume for her final class project. Bob bought the fabric. She got an it. Soon after, I was asked to give a keynote address to the English Department Award Bank, itching as always to subvert expectations and bring a bit of humor to typical, typically humdrum. I enlisted the aid of my friend and colleague, Joey Franklin, who, with his close cropped thinning hair, but without a goatee, looks remarkably like Michel de Montaigne. At this time, we borrowed Bob's blouse, bought a fake mustache, and convinced the theater department to let us a rough then set him up in a nearby room on a laptop, poised to interrupt my dignified discourse with an ill-timed Skype call. So there I was, droning away to the assembled honorees about the importance of Montaigne, paging through PowerPoints projected behind me to a big screen when there interrupted a startling sound and appeared a pop-up window. Flustered, embarrassed, apologizing, I took the call, marveled at the serendipity. How appropriate, I said to Montaigne. I was just telling these people about you. I wish you could have been there. The crowd was first mortified, then confounded, then relieved once they realized the shtick. Holding attention with the spectacle, Montaigne and I conversed at length on topics of wide interest, such as the empathic influence of essays, the charms and perils of idleness and attentiveness, the need for balance, the interconnectedness of all things. Joey's French accent is peccable, somewhere between his Peter Clouseau and Pepe Le Pew. After that successful trial run, I discovered that one of our graduate students, Shelley Spots, is a costume designer. I asked her if she'd be willing to make a Montaigne costume, and she agreed. The English department let me use research funds to pay for it. Shelley modeled the garb on the famous 1580 portrait, featuring a rather dour Montaigne gussied up in his finery, including a satiny, puffy overcoat, burgundy on his right sleeve, and ivory on his left. That's Joey wearing that. And there's me. Halfway wearing it. After surprise appearances at the Nonfiction Now Conference in Flagstaff, the Leadership Conference in Los Angeles, another keynote at our sister school, and a lead role in perhaps the silliest book trailer ever made, which we will show you in just a minute. The costume now hangs in its dry cleaner's bag on the back of my door, messing up my muscle memory. I suppose I could store the clothes elsewhere at home or in Joy's office, perhaps, and I may. So I feel a fleeting glee every time I glance over my shoulders at the door and see the outfit hanging there alongside portraits of my children and below a copy of the dot matrix sign my father years ago hung in all his children's... Oh, that's the URL if anybody wants. Don't do it now, but later on you could find that book trail, but we'll show it to you. Uh, back to where I was? Yeah. The dot matrix sign my father years ago hung in all his children's bedrooms admonishing, do it now, do it quickly in response to our general lackadaisy, our tendency to ignore chores, refuse requests, or to get caught up in too many tasks and complain about our lack of time. 
Little did we know, my father knew. I smiled at the incongruities of existence, the recursions and extrapolations, the way experience seems to close upon itself, but refuses to shut, remains open, confounds our automatic responses, demands our attention, the action of a thoughtful mind at some distance from the events. I think also to Montaigne's office with its inscriptions in the rafters, words to live by and write by, such as, I do not understand, I pause, I examine. Which humble habit, though it opposes my father's fine advice, fits the essaying process aptly, admirably, as well as enacts the metaphor we seem to have abandoned paragraphs ago. Seemed to, grammarians might know. I'll pause here to uh, let Philip share the book trailer. <laughs> My friend, are you ready? Yes, sir. You lubricated it. <laughs> I, I, let, let's begin to write this essay. Okay. Your friend Madden needs some help. I was thinking. I was thinking. What we know. Uh, what we know or what we think we know. Ah, that's better. How much do we know? Not much. Always surrounded by mystery. Oh, that is good, that is good. Surrounded which, by mystery. Which uh, makes an essay both uh, necessary and uh, indeterminate. Indeterminate. Simple. Always. Always. Look, Michel, I've got a beer goggles. <laughs> oh, that is very funny. Uh, Germans. This book is like Seabold and Montaigne got drunk and wrote a book together. That's actually what this book is like. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. All right, thanks. So that's me playing W.J. Seabold, another quite Montaigne-style writer, I think. Um, and my friend and colleague, Joy Franklin, uh, who has a bit of a better Montaigne look, so I let him borrow the costume quite often. Uh... I think in the interest of time, I will skip one thing I was going to share, and I'll jump to a, a recent bit of work. Um, the essay is the introduction to uh, my next book, the things that I'm working on currently. And um, they're all essays that begin with the phrase, I have just. And this essay is the introductory note, so it will explain where that came from. There's no PowerPoint to it. Um, I've called the essays recenses uh, or recensions. Recense is a kind of editing, and the recension is um, something recent. I have just showered, as I do nearly every morning without incident. But this time, as I was rinsing off the soap, there appeared in my mind the phrase, I have just. That's all. Just, I have just. It seemed to come of its own accord, free from catalyst or context. Curious, I engaged my conscious mind, perhaps unwisely, to trace it, locate it, find its source. For once this worked. By the time I had dressed, I knew it was Montaigne. Rather, more correctly, Montaigne is translated by Donald Frame in, in the middle of the essay of A Monstrous Child. I found in my mind a slightly longer phrasing. <clears throat> I have just seen a shepherd in Medoc, and later I found in my book I have just seen a shepherd in Medoc, 30 years old or thereabouts, who has no sign of genital parts. He has three holes by which he continually makes water. He is bearded, has desire, and likes to touch women. And that's all Montaigne has to say about the shepherd. In a sense, he fulfills with this shepherd what he vowed at the beginning of the essay regarding the child. His story will go its way simply, for I leave it to the doctor to discuss it, which I've always read as a promise to practice restraint and in interpretation. I'm just going to tell you what I saw, he seems to be saying, not tell you what it means. That such a spare recounting is antithetical to what an essay is and does did not seem to trouble the author. And given that Montaigne was making it up as he went, 
It is a new and extraordinary amusement, he said. I'll, of course, give him a pass, especially because after he tells his story of the monster's child across two substantial paragraphs of description, quite a bit more than he usually musters, he tries out his first metaphor. The toddler with his conjoined twin can serve the king as a favorable prognostic for the future of united France, despite religious contentions between Protestants and Catholics. Oh, I'm pretty sure not even Montaigne thought that was an interesting idea. But thing, then things do get interesting. In later editions, Montaigne returned to and expanded the essay, first with a reference to Epimenides, who was said to prophesy backwards, and then with the bare description of the shepherd, and then in an even later revision with the didactic twist that shouldn't work, but works just fine, even better than fine, because it calls us all out on believing that our way of seeing is the way of seeing. What we call monsters are not so to God, who sees in the immensity of his work the infinity of forms that he has comprised in it. He reminds us or alerts us for the first time that we are beings trapped in cultures, often unawares, making judgments from within them as if they were self-evident. We call contrary to nature what happens contrary to custom. Nothing is anything but according to nature, whatever it may be. I wonder if maybe the shepherd sparked the sermon, or Epimenides, whose poetical statement that Cretans, always liars, fashioned a tomb for Zeus, made its way through centuries of memory and quotation, with a stop in the Bible even, in Paul's letter to Titus, to emerge 2,000 years later as a famous paradox, all Cretans are liars. Which, when I read it now, seems nothing more than hyperbolic criticism, but which, when you hear it spoken by Ep Epimenides, himself a Cretan, becomes self-referentially impossible to resolve. That is, if you understand our liars to mean that a Cretan can never tell the truth. If the statement is true, it's false because the Cretan said it, and vice versa, and so on ad infinitum. While Montaigne seems to have broader, had, have had broader access to Epimenides four centuries ago, the philosopher remains in the contemporary consciousness almost solely on the basis of this paradox that bears his name, though he likely never quite said it. Nor did my father ever quite say it, though he loved to share with me riddles of the truth-teller and liar variety. In one, your boat lands on an island inhabited by two groups of people, one of them truth-tellers and the other liars. You're hoping to find the truth-tellers, of course, because maybe they're also friendly while the liars are dangerous. There's two chaps waiting on the beach to greet you, and you discern somehow that they're one of each, but you can't tell which is which. So you shout out while still away from shore, are you a truth-teller or a liar? The left-hand guy, assuming that you're talking to him, shouts back his answer, but just then your ship's horn blasts, drowning out all other sound. Apparently, these guys can only answer once, so you have to ask the other guy, what did he say? This time you can hear, and right-hand man says, he says he's a truth teller, but he's not. I am. Which one do you trust? And, in my favorite, you make it to the afterlife and are confronted with two identical unmarked doors, one to heaven and one to hell, guarded by two identically imposing beings. One, you know, maybe from the pamphlet of instructions you picked up in the lobby, always tells the truth. The other always lies. You get to ask one of them one single question about the doors. Ask about the doors. How can you ensure that you'll choose the correct door and enter into eternal glory? I suppose I could tell the answers right now, but I really want to encourage you to think. The first one, I think, is a good bit easier than the second, perhaps simply because you're tasked with resolving a binary, while in the second, you're required to invent something useful. I thought it might be useful since I found a bootleg online searchable edition of Frame's Montaigne translation to see where else Montaigne uses the phrase, I have just, since I've adopted it as my catalyst. Most instances are non-narrative of the, <clears throat> as I have just said, variety. Several refer to his reading and researching while writing. One of these appears as a parenthetical interruption, demonstrating the side-slipping processional nature of essaying, as well as the requisite humility and conversational relationship with past writers. He says, when I undertake to speak indiscriminately of everything that comes to my fancy without using any but my own natural resources, if I happen, as I often do, to come across in the good authors those same subjects I have attempted to treat, as in Plutarch, I have just this very moment come across his discourse on the power of imagination, Seeing myself so weak and puny, so heavy and sluggish, in comparison with those men, 
I hold myself in pity and disdain. Worth noting that this appears in Of the Education of Children, but Montaigne mentions Plutarch in relation to his essay of the power of the imagination, which is now diminished because of the former's earlier and better effort, according to Montaigne. One uses one other example uses the phrase in a different sense with an active possess, have, and, and only just instead of recently. Happy beyond my desert, this is quoted, happy beyond my deserts if I have just this share of public approval, that I make men of understanding feel that I was capable of profiting by knowledge, if I had had any, and that I deserve better assistance from my memory. Only one other I have just refers to an event, and is quite similar to the shepherd in Medoc. It might easily have found its place as a third encounter in the Monstrous Child essay, but Montaigne assigns it to his considerations on custom and not easily changing an accepted law. Quote, I have just seen in my house a little man, a native of Nantes, born without arms, who has so well adapted his feet for the service his hands owed him that in truth they have half forgotten their natural function. Moreover, he calls them his hands. He carves, he loads a pistol and fires it, he threads his needle, he sews, he writes, he doffs his hat, he combs his hair, he plays cards and dice, and moves them with as much dexterity as any other could do. That's the end of the quote. In any case, now I'm noticing more the beginning of the beginning of Montaigne's essay. This story will go its way simply, which offers or supposes a will for the story, grants it volition. The story wends its own way. The writer follows where it goes. So that's what I'm practicing here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you for sharing um, from your from your new work, which I'm looking forward to a lot. So recenses or recensions, which is due out, uh, or you're in the middle of writing it, right? Is that? Yeah. If I can finish it quickly enough, it could be out the end of next year. Yeah. Uh, I'm lucky great. enough to have a contract for the book already. So unless I mess things up royally, it will actually. Okay. So I'm happy about that. Well, looking forward to it. Um, so before I go to some questions in the chat, um, if I could just ask one of my own, which is a sort of, uh, uh, you know, I'm always fascinated by how, how people write. Um, and you, you know, you talked about the, I have just as a, I think you called it a catalyst as was one way of like getting the engines running, I suppose. Um, right. yeah, I just wanted to ask a really simple question. Uh, how, how do you write essays by which I mean, what are the processes you have in place? Do you collect yeah. ideas on bits of paper and stick them in a box? Do you sit down and just try to find it? How do you, how do you, how do you go about it? If there's an answer to that? Um, and maybe, maybe it's not the exact same way every time, but, um, going back to when I was studying in, in the master's program here at BYU, uh, my method then was, I had a cool story, something that was interesting that happened to me and I would write what happened. And the conclusions are that, the ways of interacting with my own past were somewhat simplistic. Usually they weren't like the the very first response, but they were like the, the only the second response. So some quick turn to make something unexpected of the experience, but usually not that unexpected. Um, but my my teacher and the essays I read seem to say that a better method is to sally forth without quite knowing where you're going so this is like a samuel johnson definition of the essay a loose sally of the mind and that was pretty daunting i was unsure it would work and so i resisted for a long time but uh, eventually i got to where my essays have become like they may be assemblages of thematic uh things so i have i'm thinking of one essay on um originality that i, I wrote it's a very long essay and I just started jotting down notes about originality and plagiarism and creativity and what that means. And uh, at the time, a book by David Shields was very popular called Reality Hunger. And the book derived from his own class notes. And um, he was lazy or sloppy in citing his sources. So he kind of... Um, Pulled a Seneca, whatever is well said of another is mine. And he he really, really wanted to publish the book with no credit given to any of the originating authors. Uh, his publisher eventually obliged him, obligated him to, but he did it in tiny font at the very back of the book. So it was a kind of a 
a, a popular book at the time. He even got on the Colbert Report and spoke about his book. So I decided I would do something similar, but flipped. And I asked uh, a number of my essayist friends to write sections of the essay for me in my voice. Like if they were to try to pretend to be Pat Madden, what would that look like? So that was just like this assemblage of not only different ideas and stories and elements, but other people too, without credit. They were told this ahead of time. So uh, that's one way. But lately, so these I have just essays. One of the prevailing wisdoms about essays, at least now 20th century, is that an author should have some temporal and emotional distance from the event they're writing, right? That way you have the space to think on meaning and you're not just kind of in the heat of the emotional response to what happened. Um, and I think it's, I do think it's good advice, but I wanted to subvert that. And I think it's one of the primary drivers of essays is to subvert expectations. And so I have just provides that. I'm trying to write about things that only recently happened and see where they take me. And I, they're usually mundane things. They're usually like nothing dramatic, suspenseful, nothing you could film, make a movie of. And I'm, so then I just start writing and see where it goes and see what the language does. So um, I just completed an essay. Uh, Facebook reminded, this was an older event, but the recent thing was Facebook popped up, uh, you know, on this date 12 years ago, um, a memory of traveling the eastern beaches of Uruguay with my family. And Karina, my wife, had posted about how glorious it was, how lovely, beautiful. But I remember, too, that on that trip, our two oldest children, we, we'd gone to the beach at Punta del Diablo. And most of the young kids were on the shore. We had some cousins there. But the older kids took a boogie board and went out. And then they weren't coming back. I was shouting to them. They weren't coming back. And I started swimming out to <clears throat> get them. And I tried to swim in with them. And it was rough. The waves. And I realized we were caught in a riptide. So we swam parallel to shore, came back. We were exhausted. That's the story. But it actually ended up becoming an essay about the way the Spanish language, which I learned as an adult and still speak. We speak Spanish at home quite a bit. We travel to Uruguay all the time. Uh, has opened the doors, not just to like a second language, but it kind of opened the doors to English too, right? By Because I, this is kind of the perspective thing we were talking about earlier. I only had one language and I assumed that that way of organizing material was kind of the way, like reality equaled the language that held it. Learning Spanish, which is not that different from English. They, they share a Latin root and, you know, a lot of cognates, but still different enough to kind of destabilize an a certainty that I wasn't even sure that I had. Or I didn't realize that I had. So that essay becomes about um, <clears throat> perspective and language and this sort of thing. I didn't know that when I started. I just was like, oh, yeah, that riptide thing. Let me check that out. While I was writing that essay... <laughs> My friend, Hassan Kassir-Sena, who read the essay, looked up Riptide in the dictionary and found that the Oxford English Dictionary cites Gerard Manley Hopkins as the first source of the word Riptide in the English language. But guess what? They're wrong. It's not Gerard Manley Hopkins. It's Manley Hopkins' father. Okay? And when I went to find, I thought that doesn't make sense. He's 18 at the time the book was published. He's not writing a book about Hawaii. All right. So I went to Google books to find the book to see if the word riptides in there and they have the wrong book. So they have like this, like shipping report on Port Phillip, New, New South Wales in Australia miscategorized as that book. So um, as I was falling asleep one night, the phrase, I have just gone on a wild goose chase, came came to mind. And so that's a second essay. And what was I going to write? I'm going to write about not finding, it's not Gerard, it's his dad, Manly. I told Google Books they had their own book and they passed the buck to, oh, that's the library project, not our fault. And um, 
And then I get thinking about the phrase wild goose chase and how our family in Uruguay, my wife's family has geese, they're tame geese, and I'm not chasing them, but they're chasing me when I'm trying to hang the laundry, right? So it's just kind of, I could not have predicted that's where it would go, but it like picked up because of the language itself, the language itself suggests what else might come round into that essay. And mostly I'm just amusing myself. And so that's very amusing to me, like just start with no plan at all, just a little memory of or something that recently happened and follow the language. And it always comes like, then you got to sew things together and thread your themes. And I don't know, sometimes it, it feels like it will fail, but usually it works out. So. Failing is failing's not a bad thing sometimes too. Yeah. Uh, so I get to go, so I have other questions from me, but um, uh, I will go to the ones in the Q&A. Um, so John O'Brien has some a couple of comments and a question. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, he says for your sparkling readings and comments on Montaigne. Uh, he then says, uh, if your reviewer thought Montaigne would never entitle a chapter titled Spit, he should read what Montaigne is alluding to in 149 when he mentions sponges, uh, which is the chapter uh, Des Coutumes Anciennes on ancient culture cu customs. I guess I don't I don't know the uh, French translation, but um, yeah, but I won't I won't I won't mention what it's about here, but it's <clears throat> yeah, it certainly would be uh would be a good way to respond to him. So thank you, John. Uh, and then he has a question on a more serious note. Uh, what do you make of Screech's translation of the essays? Ah, so I have Screech's translation, and I think I I find it to be quite excellent. I, I would say just going back to um John's first comment about 149, this was my nightmare preparing for this. Uh podcast the conversation was like i'm not expert enough to know what that's even referring to right so i'm i'm opening up my book and and, and then you just kind of i i think i will just hold that in mind and i have yeah anyway i love that john knows this well enough and yeah the general sense that montana was all about he, nothing was forbidden but um the screech i picked up just a few years after I, which I have, I, yeah. So this is like a similarly imposing tome. This is the screech that I have. Um, a, a dear, dear friend of mine, Desiree Matherly, who we went to graduate school together and were in the same exact classes all the time, but she's a, a screech fan. So we sometimes have, you know, lighthearted debate about the better translation. Um, my... I'd say that it's just my ignorance that prevents me from uh, appreciating Screech enough to overtake the frame. Or like, it's my inertia, right? I hold to that first translation that I read and loved and, well, read and disliked and then eventually loved. And so that's why it's so important to me. But I also have, like, I just have collected, because they're pretty cheap used books, uh, like Zeitlin and Tretchman and... Uh, a bunch of other translations. And so I often, oh, Cohen, I have uh, students compare translations one to another. And usually it's not that anybody's wrong. It's just that they render the text in ways that might be more suitable to a 21st century young person over a 20th century old person or whatever that may be. So. Absolutely. No, that makes sense that the... Um... I first read Virgil in Alan Mandelbaum's translation, and I, I, there have been a number of really good and really important ones since then. But I, you know, it's like the, the memory is up here of certain verses and the the rhythm of it, and it's hard to, um, I, you know, it's like people are drink Bordeaux or Burgundy. It's hard to do both. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Is so that I wouldn't know, but I do know. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's like a musical memory of mm. the way the text is rendered in that one translation. So a question from, from someone you know well, Bob Hudson. Yeah. So Bob says, thank you, Pat, for sharing that useful photo of me with a resplendent, entirely chestnut brown beard. Looking at my reflection in my office window, I see how gray I've become. As I age, Montaigne helps. How has uh, the Montaigne project evolved for you with age? And do you see your own essays dealing with our inevitable march towards grayness? 
Ooh. Yeah, so I think this was uh, this is one of the ideas that Jeff Purcell's brought up in his Why Should We Read Montaigne in the 21st century, right? Um, Montaigne helps us age with humor, he, he said, I think, if I remember right. And I, I definitely agree that that's the way it's been for me. Um, I'm not too far from the, the oldest Montaigne ever got now. I'm, I'm just half a decade away. And um, so it does feel to me like he is more my contemporary now than when I first encountered him. That may be another reason why um, I didn't quite get him at first. I was too young and stupid at the time. Um, but yeah, I find in the essays, and it, some of it has to do with like the breakdown of the body. And uh, so in that essay that you talked about in the introduction of practice, that's kind of what that essay became. It took its inspiration from a practice, but as I say in that little uh, coda to the essay, I think it actually became an essay. It became of age instead of a practice because it, it really was me grappling with uh, this sport that at one time was a big part of my life. As I say, I think in the essay, I say I majored in volleyball my senior year. I was just playing volleyball constantly, any moment I could. And um, it was a kind of, I didn't, I don't think I even understood this at the time, but it was a, a, a pleasure of being in a body, right? And, and that the body responded in the ways I wanted it to, or it could be trained to do so. And I do still play volleyball uh, with my kids. I, I coach them still. I play in the backyard with friends and neighbors. Uh, every now and then I go down Friday at noon, BYU faculty and some guests play a, a pickup volleyball game. Um, and the volleyball on Fridays lately has been very good. People can run plays and, and stuff like that, but everybody there is middle-aged. And you can tell everybody had their glory days to whatever level they reached. And now the glory is almost vanished, at least dissipated, right? Um, can't jump as high, can't hit as hard, the joints ache for days afterwards and so forth. Um, so strangely, just not just of age, not just of practice, but um, not just of experience and its dealings with kidney stones at length, right? Um, but all the essays, I think, they are embodied works of writing, right? There was, I don't think, ever an attempt even by Montaigne to um, escape his his own self in the body, you know? Um, but also, I think I've become more uh, humble than I once was, which isn't to claim that I've achieved any great levels of humility. But the Montaigne essays do model that for me too. And so I guess the long answer to Bob's question is, yeah, <laughs> me too. Uh, I looked at some old pictures of myself recently, Bob, and I didn't always have the gray hair either. So, although it feels like it's been there forever. So a question from Matthew McNary. Uh, in what order would you recommend reading Montaigne? There are so many translations, so many versions, and so many essays, the decisions are intimidating. Uh, and yeah, the... Um, I mean, the, you spoke a little bit to that in the in the first part, I guess, in the questionnaire. But um, uh, but yeah, any further thoughts on on how to go about tackling Montaigne? I suppose. Um. In my, I may offend some people. I think that the mid range essays, the essays that are about, I don't know, ten to twenty pages, are usually good for starting. Right. The shorter essays, I did. I did talk about three of the shorter essays today, which I do really love, but there are some other shorter essays that seem to be more about say military strategy or like things that they don't essay much in my view. So 
Um, it might seem like short essays would be the way to start, but some of them still aren't my favorite. So the mid-range essays like um, of cruelty and presumption and cripples and practice, I think it would be a really good place to start. And then to the longer essays in the third book, so repentance and vanity and um, yeah, those two. <laughs> The essay that I don't teach anymore, I tried it only one time, the Apology for Raymond Sabon. I think uh, Matthew, Matt Ansel's here in the in the webinar too. He would be offended. I think I've already offended him with this, but um, he loves the apology and I think there's great value to it, but um, it's hard because it's like it's a book in itself. Um, so I don't know, you just might page through. I think some other favorites of mine, I like of names, the power of the imagination, that to philosophy. The the piece that I skipped over today kind of looks at on the power of the imagination at a, a bit of a link of cannibals, of prayers. Yeah. And you can just dip in anywhere too. And if it if it doesn't float your boat right yeah. away, jump to another one. Yeah. No, I think that's true. I mean you can just flip it open almost like Vigilia and lots and, and just start reading anywhere I think you're right and uh, I started the the semester with um <clears throat> I was really sort of tossing up whether to do like in the very first class before people have read anything whether to do on idleness or on thumbs and I actually went with on thumbs and right. it's so there's like not a you know there's not not a not a not a tiny little period too much you know it's like so tight and there's not a single moment where he sort of expresses himself like his own opinion on the thing it's like it's it's so great like it's such a great it, it worked really well so yeah I, yeah that's it but as you say there's so many places to start so a question from mary mckinley uh who first of all thank you she says for uh for a wonderful conversation uh and then still um on this topic of teaching how do you find undergraduates reacting to the first reading of montaigne are there any surprises yeah um so i've taught uh, literature class on Montaigne's essays, I think, four times now, over 20 years. So it doesn't come up very often, but I did teach one just a year ago. Mm. Uh, in that class, I think two-thirds of the students had never even heard of Montaigne. And I think the class fit their schedule and got them, you know, the numerical check mark credit for whatever they needed. So they were just like, whatever's good for me. I did have a another third of the students who had run Montana, had one student who was already uh, quite well-versed and a fan. They don't really tell me that they're afraid of offending me, I think, but I, I would say by the end of the semester, two thirds were converts to Montaigne's way of thinking and writing and they, they caught on, they were in love. And it, probably about a third of them just kind of jumped through the hoops, got their credit. But there were some really exciting um, final papers, like uh, one that stands out. And this is a student who is now planning to go to graduate school in French studies. Um, but he kind of wrote Montaigne's Guide to Interacting on Social Media. And so it was like a really cool... Um, contemporary application of Montaigne's wisdom. And he noticed some of the same things that I was talking about and why we should read Montaigne today, right? Um, social media, especially is a kind of um, uh, intense version of the malaises that we see in our world today, right? The divisiveness and rudeness and so forth. And he kind of went to Montaigne's biography. I was able to maintain a kind of diplomatic neutrality and speak with warring parties during his time, leave the gates open to the to the chateau and welcome people as his strategy for uh, maintaining the peace. And there were other, um, I had a student who created a uh, game of life, Montaigne version like the actual game with cards about like different events in your life or opportunities. And that was quite 
quite clever. So um, I am generally pleased with how students respond to Montaigne, most of them who've never read his work and or even heard of him before. So it's pretty cool because I remember when I was in their shoes too. Um, and I can, I think, try to help them through the initial encounters where this is a different kind of writer than we're used to. Can I ask, um, we're sort of out of time, but I want to ask a follow-up question just because, uh, so, <clears throat> and I think it's sort of at the line uh, that separates you as a reader of Montaigne and you as a writer of essays uh, and, and you as a teacher, so three lines, I guess. Um, uh, you know, it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently, I suppose, which is the way in which Montaigne in particular, essays in general, or uh, the way that... Uh, students who uh, have learned to write academic prose in a certain way uh, are then confronted with, uh, as you say, like such a different writer. And I'm wondering if in, in your experience, uh, whether it's, you know, talking with students about Montaigne or how, teaching uh, um, the, the essay in general, uh, and because uh, clearly in your, in your process, Montaigne has had a big impact. It's, he's taught you a lot about how to how to let go of rules and how to hold on to certain other rules, right? Including ones that came from Blas von Trier and stuff. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, like, so I guess I guess my question is about this, like how does, in your experience, how is essay writing or Montaigne's essays uh, sort of filtered into a way of helping students see this other kind of writing and then take control of their own writing, I guess, in, in some, some, something like you have done, right? Yeah. I, Does that make sense of the question? I don't know. It was all over the place, but but it, it's... Yeah. <laughs> well, the, I, those are the great questions, right? Those are the good kind of questions. I think that um, we don't even realize what we are influenced by, for the most part. Mm. Even people who are, uh, you know, thinking about these things more frequently, we still don't have a good uh, list of, like, how we are influenced by the things that we take in from our culture, because so much of the influence happens subconsciously. Much happens before we have memory. Like we don't remember learning our first language, for instance, and that's an entire system of processing the world that feels to us like it has came preloaded, but it's mm -hmm. not preloaded in humanity, right? Because there are many different languages and ways. <clears throat> so um, I think so much of, the way we think and write is influenced by the the things that we don't actively seek out, but they're just like bombard us. So television and maybe music and movies and so forth. And there's a certain, say like the Freytag pyramid model for mapping out the way a story works, right? Mm -hmm. That's certainly one way. It, it's it's a, a box that you can put a lot of stories in, but once you have that pyramid shape, then maybe that's, also perpetuating itself, creating more works that fit that shape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, reading Montaigne in so many ways, uh, just kind of like shakes me and says, why, why do you assume that is how it must be done? Mm -hmm. But a lot of, a lot of students, myself included, come in thinking that you need a hook, you need an arc. You need mm -hmm. character development. You need, you know, set us in a scene and then the scene develops into some understanding. And it, like Montaigne doesn't do much of that, if at all, right? So um, it challenges and subverts our like unquestioned assumptions. And then it not only changes the way we can write, I don't think, my students and I don't really get all the way to Montaigne, but he just exerts his influence to pull toward the curious and speculative and the exploratory and subversive and all these things. And then you can still write a story, but you could write a story that does some more thinking, deeper thinking about your mm -hmm. experience instead of, you know, coming to an unearned and cliched conclusion. Mm -hmm. Um and so that's been, to me, the greatest benefit and one of the greatest joys of reading, writing, and teaching Montaigne. It's a good place to end. Thank you so much, Patrick. No, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and to, to share your work today. I'm super grateful, Philip, and everybody who attended, too, and all the good questions. Thanks, everybody.
So I encourage, I encourage everybody to, to go out and, and read Patrick if you haven't already. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we'll keep an eye out for your, your latest, uh, your newest book when it comes out, um, very soon, hopefully. So thank you so much. Oops. Sorry. So, um, our next episode of conversations with people who read Montaigne will be on March 25th with Vittoria Falanca, currently at Durham University, who will be talking to us about the notion of design, dessin in the essay. Uh, this will be at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. Paris time. You can sign up for uh, the Zoom link at montaigne.us. The episode after that on April 29th will feature world specialist of Montaigne, John O'Brien, also at 1 p.m. New York time, but 7 p.m. Paris time. And again, uh, you can sign up for the link at montaigne.us. All episodes of the series are or will be available online, and you can consult them as well as accompanying materials such as summaries, bibliographical references, and so forth by going to, once more, montaigne.us. It remains for me to thank uh, the Maison Française of New York University, especially François Nudelman and Courtney Rutherford, the Department of French Literature, Thought and Culture, and its chair, Emily Apter, and NYU's Medieval and Renaissance Center, and its director, Martha Rust. And especially thank you, Patrick, for joining us, and thank you all uh, on Zoom for joining us today. Take care. Thanks again.